got significantly further to my left. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah. All right, we ready? Oh, because of this. <laughs> All right, this one, this one, this passage is a bit long, so we'll just jump in. Sweet, let's do it. It's Ezekiel 16. Are we ready to go, guys? We're good. All right. What up, everybody? Welcome. Glad you're here to uh, 1189, because that's how many chapters there are in the Bible. Today, we're looking at one of them, Ezekiel chapter 16. We're just going to jump in today because there's a ton of content in this chapter, and we have Chick-fil-A coming soon, and so we don't want to <laughs> miss that. So we're just going to skip the inane banter. Um, chapter 16 is the longest portion of Ezekiel, but obviously the chapter lengths are man-made. I, uh, I do think it's a great chapter division that they did. It's it, it itself is longer than six of the 12 minor prophets. The chapter utilizes lawsuit language. Before we get to that, here's a meme that someone made. Um, <laughs> after last week that I thought was really good. They did a great job. Um, That's funny. Here's an overview. Um, we've got that. Let's check this out, okay? So there's lawsuit court language in Ezekiel chapter 6. The judge, a plaintiff, the defendant, okay? Then in, in addition to that, there is uh, this is a prophetic oracle that tells a prophetic history of Israel. So just like did you notice that chapter 14 with his like battle with the elders and chapter 15 were very self-contained? Mm -hmm. This chapter is very self-contained as well. It's like one story and then it they all add up to things together, but you just take it as it is right. for itself. So um, there's a great piece of content here. Um, on the court language in Ezekiel chapter 16. Um, this is uh, an idea called judgment speech. So there's a commissioning formula in the introduction. There is a summons like we, s we, we call the defendant, right? Like we would see in our court system. Then there is an accusation, a sentence, and a conclusion. Um, that's the format it's going to go through here. Origen said, why is it that I admire Ezekiel? Because the order was given to him to make known to Jerusalem its abominations, and he didn't place before his eyes any danger that would result from his preaching. But in order to keep only the precepts of God, he spoke whatever he was told. Let's realize that there was a mystery and that there was a revelation of a mysterious kind on the subject of Jerusalem and all that is said against it. Nevertheless, he prophesied and accused it of fornication. So, um, this is one of the most aggressive passages in the entire Bible. This chapter and chapter 23 are, contain some of the most sexualized language in the entire Bible. So, um, you know, genuinely, you might not want your kids to hear this. I wouldn't read this passage out loud to my kids. They're between the ages of five and eight, and somehow there's three in that range. Should we ask Logan to leave? Yeah. I'm way too young for yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> Good Lord. So it's, um, um, this is something that I wrote uh, about this to give you, I call, I call Ezekiel 16 the anti-fairy tale. Oh, oh okay. It is the anti-fairy tale of the people of Israel. And so, um, so this won't be a Disney remake anytime soon no and there's this idea called um suspended disbelief with science fiction and things like that it's like a film idea which is effectively like can people suspend their disbelief and how ludicrous the story is and it's just a you know a strength marker of things like that i think that um for a chapter like this depending on where you sit politically and things like that i think it's important for you to suspend um, your judgment on some of the language that is used and it's mm -hmm. used for a very specific reason I make no apologies for it, but I will say that it's awkward and it does make me feel a little bit awkward And so we're gonna have Logan read all of the awkward parts um, To make him feel awkward <laughs> and more awkward than everyone else and help his dating prospects. You're right. Let's, this will not help. Let's jump into <laughs> Set him back light years. I didn't know that Logan was a misogynist. <laughs> okay, so um, verse 16 again, or chapter 16, again the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations, right? So this is the anti-fairy tale about the abominations of the people of Israel. Say, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem. 
your origin and birth are the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite, which of course reminds me of this moment from have you seen this <laughs> yes. seen this yes. movie? It's classic. This is from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I funny watermark. That's crazy. You need to watch you need to watch this you and your roommate. That's what you took away that from this joke? <laughs> yeah. Yep, your, your mother was a hamster <laughs> and your father smelled of elderberries. I call up your sister and say silly things to her. <laughs> <laughs> it's dude, it's a really funny movie. I like that director's other stuff too, man. Brazil, that movie's amazing. All right, so Canaanite, your, your birth are of the land of the Canaanites. Can, Jerusalem was a Canaanite city given to the people of God. This is just sarcasm when he's saying that birth are of the land of the Canaanites. That's just sarcasm. Um, Irony to show contempt is the way I wrote it down. Amorite, Hittite, um, that's, that's not true. This is like a polemical discourse. Um, it's a critical attack um, on people. That's why I posted this joke because it literally is. This is a joke version of what is being said. Mm. Yeah, so, so it's like, yeah, so it's, it's like saying like your, you know, your dad was a deadbeat and your mom was a. Exactly. A town floozy. Exactly. And that, that actually is where he's going with much more aggressive language than that. Jerusalem may as well be a Canaanite city and your parents may as well be Amorite and Hittite is the way I wrote it down. Um, the three largest groups that were originally in the land are those three, Canaanite, Amorite, Hittite. So you see what he's saying. Yeah. The, the, the criticism of, Jer of Israel all throughout the Old Testament is you aren't doing the things that I told you to do. You didn't drive the people out. You didn't get rid of the idols. You're just, you're just them now. You're just doing all of these yeah. horrific yeah. things. Um, and there are four um, um, oracles here introduced by this Hebrew word rib. It's a judgment uh, courtroom oracle, and they share similarities. You'll, you'll notice in 16, 20, 22, and 23, those verses that there are similar, um, um, or, or rather chapter 16, 20, 22, and 23. You'll notice those um, similar um, openings to those. Verse 4, as for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling cloths, like little baby Jesus. <laughs> No, I pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you, but you were cast out into the open field for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. So there's uh, the, the language actually gets more aggressive than this. And so I just want to say at the outset, um, th these are um, metaphorical descriptions. It's a fairy tale. It's an yeah. anti fairy tale. So don't he's going to say the word horror like a thousand times. So don't read your modern sensibility into that it does a disservice to the passage because he, he they're not they're not making a person to person comment he is making a god to people group comment and he is continuing the idea throughout the old testament that sexuality is a perfect metaphor for spirituality that's the idea so you know how in the bible app you can highlight a verse and then you can create an instagram post with pretty images yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not yeah. the chapter to take those from. Like Get I that made in the one. Mix on here. It's like a pretty sunset in the background, and it just says, "You were thrown out into the open field for the day you were born. You were despised." <laughs> Get that in the mix. Post. Yeah, that'd get a lot of shares. Mm -hmm. So the cord cut—that's a universal practice, of course, with uh, newborns. Washed with water would be to get the blood and all of that stuff off. Rubbed with salt is actually a Middle Eastern tradition that's still practiced by some. And um, wrapped, of course, we all, you know, us three who have kids, we all remember that moment where you wrap up your kid in that little, like, blanket and look like a little Chipotle burrito mm -hmm. and full of love. It's the most magnificent moment. Um, and here he's just obviously flipping it on its head. I mean, what a disaster that um, a newborn baby wouldn't have anyone that wanted to do those things for them. It's an absolute catastrophe. And that feeling you're getting in your heart, that is the goal uh, of the passage. Um we learn from 2 Samuel 5 that the Jebusites had retained control of Jerusalem. And from Joshua uh, Judges 1, the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites. So that's something that I have written here for some reason because it ties in. Um, John Calvin said, He simply means that they were so despicable that they had no standing among men. For loathing of life means the same as rejection. So that's the idea there. Verse 6. Um, and uh, I passed by you and saw you wallowing in your blood. 
and I said to you, uh, to your, to you in your blood, live. I said to you, he repeats himself, in your blood, live. I made you flourish like a plant of the field, and you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. Your breasts were formed, your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. So um, this is the first section of the anti-fairy tale, an orphan gets saved. The orphan is the, the woman in this anti-fairy uh, tale is Israel. We view um, like the idea of breasts or the idea of a person being naked. We view that as inherently sexual. That's a mistake of postmodern culture, mm. certainly American culture. They're not saying anything sexual. They're they're like like if you've ever seen the statue of David, um, that that stunning was it Michelangelo mm -hmm. statue. Mm -hmm. Our culture would be like, oh, that's sexual. It's like no, it's not sexual. That's like Adam and Eve standing in the Garden of Eden aren't sexual. It's it, they're 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 beautiful creations of God, right? And we right. forced this into that hallway. So, um, Would uh, that have any connotation with, like, maturity? Like, your breasts were formed and you... That's exactly right. That's yeah, the yeah, yeah. That's the exact point. That makes sense to me. That's what Lamar Cooper says, uh, until she reached the, puri uh, the maturity of womanhood as a beautiful young woman of marriageable age. Uh, that's the idea there. Um, John Calvin um, says something similar... Um, and so now we're moving into the section where the, 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 or so the orphan gets saved, right? That's beautiful. It's brilliant. God chooses this nation. Um, and he's like, the, you're, you're, I'm, I'm picking you up. You're a disaster, but I'm going to save you. Right. And then the saved becomes queen. While I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you're at the age for love. So a person who has gone through puberty and is of marriageable age and is ready uh, to be married. I spread the corner of my gar uh, garment over you and covered your nakedness. So this is um, that idea in verse eight is extremely important in the Old Testament. Um, it is the opposite of Ham and what he did. And it is uh, the mm -hmm. Levitical commands against certain types of sexuality. So God often uses veiled language off and, and occasionally uses unveiled language. Uh, God almost always use veiled language when he um, is talking about actual literal sexuality and he often uses unveiled language when he's talking about metaphorical sexuality and so hmm. covered your nakedness is a veiled uh, sexual idea because it is talking about um a um a, a literal sexual thing so you're, do you remember in like leviticus and exodus and numbers where it just keeps saying don't uncover this person's nakedness and all that stuff yep. mm -hmm. it's 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 the implication the implication is why would you do that so that dot 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 it's mm -hmm. very very um veiled language on purpose and that's one of the cornerstones of the old testament when it says that ham uncovered his father's nakedness it's not saying his towel fell off and he laughed it's saying what it implies it's yeah. saying that there was an aggressive perverted sexual act that took place between a drunk father and a son it's very very upsetting and that's just the reality of it here it's using the opposite language i covered your nakedness mm. the idea is i could have taken advantage of you but i did not i chose mm. to keep you um safe and all of these things that are so beautiful spread the corner of the garment um, if you like to write things down, is this idea of covering marriage, protection, claiming a bride, right? I spread the corner of my gov a garment over you. This idea of like protection, you know, before every single thing a man did was viewed as misogynist. It's it's this idea of like protecting a woman, which is a very beautiful thing. Um, I made a vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, right? These are the three things in the Old Testament. The covenant for a land with Abraham, for a lineage with David, and for a law with Moses. God entered into a covenant with them. Um, uh, you became mine. Oh, it's such beautiful mm -hmm. language. Mm. Oh my gosh. It's such beautiful language. I bathed you with water. I washed off your blood from you, anointed you with oil. I clothed you with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. I mean, my lady's looking fresh. Yeah. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you in silk, right? I mean, this is like... This is like George Costanza saying he would <laughs> drape himself in velvet if it was socially acceptable. <laughs> that's I mean, that's now you, I'm picturing Nick in velvet. Oh, please stop. No, <laughs> no, don't, no sorry. Don't, don't proclaim break. baldness over this man. <laughs> I what are you talking about? Hair. Proclaim it. It's here. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair point. I've got one angle. So this is um, 
this is this idea of and it's interesting because a lot of those fabrics are still viewed as really you know stunning and more expensive now you know like leather and fine linen and silk yeah and um what uh it also talks about oil and anointing which is really really quick take um just a detour on that just so people understand um oil and anointing is, is extremely significant in the bible and so if you don't know that this would be a great thing for you to underline a great thing for you to study a great thing for you to take a picture of your screen if you're watching at home and just study this it's a really great thing to know um Jacob pours oil on the stone that he slept on. He's anointing an inanimate object, right? Hmm. Because anointing has significance, um, physically and spiritually. God uh, commands Moses to anoint specific pieces of furniture to consecrate them as holy. In addition to that, God tells uh, Moses to dump anointing oil on his brother's head in front of every single person in Israel. He's just soaking in this oil. That is an obvious picture of the way the Holy Spirit interacts with us now. Um, setting a part of a leader, the healing power of God. I mean, uh, after Samuel anointed David, uh, the Spirit of God rushed on him. The healing power of God, the simple anointing of a guest, um, all of that stuff. I think it's, it's exceedingly important. And you can see how in the New Testament this idea of um, anointed with the Holy Spirit or anointed with the oil of gladness um, I adorned you, verse 11, with ornaments um, and put bracelets on your wrist and a chain on your neck. I put a ring in your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Now, I love this section because I have my nose pierced. Yeah, I was thinking that. I am. I grew up a very conservative Baptist and, you know, just having your nose pierced doesn't mean that you worship Satan. Um, this is an actual Reddit post <laughs> that I found um, on the actual literal internet. And um, I think wow. that it is so funny. And I love dunking on hyper conservative people whenever I can. Um, we don't really have time for all the chicanery that I wrote down in here, but I have like three pages of content that I found online. Um, I found this. Um, I don't know if I want to get into this right have now. Have you had Have you had boomers criticize you for your nose piercing before? Um, no, but I I I make it a I make it a goal of mine to when I feel like someone is kind of like being aggressive with me, I attempt to make them feel as uncomfortable as, as they have made me feel, and I've noticed that they're really not willing to receive it back and so it often ends with them not wanting to talk about things like that with me in the future <laughs> yeah. and also because so i have like works. a very firm understanding of why i think that isn't wrong and most people don't so they're just like leviticus 19 and you're like oh is that a cotton poly blend shirt <laughs> yeah. you got on there yeah. oh, because that's your, an equivalent I see thing. your sideburns are past your ear <laughs> And they're like, the moral and ceremonial law. And you're like, dude, that's so cool that you went to like one semester of Bible college in the 80s. Like that is not the like actual yeah. way of reading that text. Um, yeah, there's no yeah. pressure. We can always, if you want to get into chicanery, we can cut a, a chapter 16 into two episodes. <laughs> it is the longest. <laughs> we can cut it into 11 episodes. <laughs> and by the end, people are it's like, for the love podcast. of God. <laughs> Please yeah. stop. Please, for the love of God, stop saying, saying the word whore. Please. <laughs> please. Yeah. YouTube is just going to completely like shut down. <laughs> like, we don't even know what to do to block this. <laughs> There's a few violations yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm we, not allowed to say it. So We do this like content live at the church that we uh, attend as well. And I've noticed that like people have slowly stopped coming to the live over <laughs> the course of the year, which is hilarious because our church has actually been growing like really, really fast. But the Bible study has been shrinking. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, I guess this is it. This is like, this is what it really is. This is the real Bible. And the remnant shall remain. Oh. Yeah, I'm so curious what that was like when you taught chapter 16. Oh, man, was it, it was it was wild. Was Lots of people shuffling around and Before moving. I quit. And oh, yeah. <laughs> I quit. She was one of the people who quit. <laughs> you That's were, so wow. funny. Wow. Carly on blast. She just outed I just yourself. I blasted myself. What was I thinking? <laughs> Oh had my nothing gosh. Nothing to do with our enjoyment this of is the awkward. content, Landon. Uh, Logan, you oh go. my nothing. gosh. <laughs> it had everything to do with our children being nightmares. I <laughs> want I wanted to tell a story about my grandma and an interaction we had with a nose piercing, but I don't want to tell it because I want her to watch this. So 
I'll just have to move on. Wait, but if she's watching, she just heard you say that. So your story is that you aren't going to tell a story because it will bother someone, but the only person that will bother already knows the story, and you're already saying they're going to watch. <laughs> <laughs> and the internet is forever. Make it make sense. Yeah. It's it pretty funny. Make sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just like found this web, like this website of this church. I'm not going to say what the church is because I don't want to like do anything like that. But I just think it's hilarious when people are like, um, throughout history, the tattooing and piercing has always been condemned by Bible believing Christians. Always. That's from their website. The fact is, up until a few years ago, virtually everyone, including the most liberal Christian, knew that tattooing and piercing was clearly forbidden by the word of God. I find stuff like this funny, and I like to dunk on it because it is not true. That's not true. It's also like a cultural thing in America. It's like people are like, why don't you wear suits to church? It's like, well, okay, that's a cultural yeah. representation of a thing. And if you want to do that, that's fantastic. Praise right. God that you want to dress up for church. I love that. But if someone comes in in sweatpants, that does not inherently mean that they <laughs> love Satan and you love God. And that's the way people treat people. And they're like, oh, don't get a tattoo or a piercing because Leviticus 19. You're like, that isn't what that passage is about. It, it isn't what it's talking about, and it isn't really that big of a deal. And you being unloving to someone because they have a small piece of metal in their nose actually is against the Bible <laughs> and actually is against the history of the way the Bible has been taught. And so I just, the, yeah, that kind of stuff, that kind of stuff uh, irritates me. And they, they wrote on here, in spite of this, many will still justify getting a tattoo. But the question that should be answered is, what is my motive and why do you want one in the first place? which is hilarious to me, and I, we should probably move on, but it's like the most anachronistic reading. Because I'd like to sympathize with the nation of Israel yeah, <laughs> being adopted by God <laughs> in Ezekiel chapter 16. Exactly. Um, yeah, God gave them piercing. God himself was the piercer. Totally, but what that, <laughs> but, but no, 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 you got to understand, like, you got to understand, like. So I, so I saw you in your blood, picked you up, and took you to Claire's to get your nose That's pierced. That's right. <laughs> Little Uzi Claire's Vert had do the, nose the oh, ruby in his head, so. <laughs> oh, actually, What'd you do. say? Yeah, you know the rapper Lil Uzi Vert? He got, I, I think, a ruby in his skull, Sweet like, Jesus. in his forehead right here. This is already going to be the longest episode we've done. Like, do we need to... Nope, we don't. Let's keep going. That's two <laughs> little Uzi Vert drops in one season <laughs> yeah. for Logan, though. Logan's thinking at every point, how can I bring this to a point about a rapper or <laughs> Scientology? <laughs> it's He's thinking, how can we get on that wavelength? It's great that in terms of the keyword search for this Pick for this ep for this podcast, Lil Uzi Vert just jumped Kurt Cameron. Yep. <laughs> Does someone? Do you have someone to pick up your kids? Nope. Just kidding, my mother-in-law. Okay, good. Because you just, an alarm went off, I and she said to pick up my kids, and then just put it away. And I was like, well, you kind of got to close that thread. She's like, hold on, let me order them an Uber. <laughs> that exists. Yeah. But That's I do so have funny. alarms for everything. Cause That's I so funny. Can't remember make kid Ubers. So I hope that didn't come off as like too aggressive to anybody. Certainly it's not as aggressive as the text we're reading, but I do think that it's important to not um, superimpose your cultural ideas onto Christianity and then judge people based on their adherence to those ideas. Mm. That actually is Phariseeism. It's incredibly, incredibly problematic. Mm. And there's a lot of things that the Bible talks about in gray areas, like meat offered to idols and different things. If you think getting a nose piercing is wrong, just don't get one. That's totally fine. And then read the New Testament because the New Testament actually calls you the weaker brother for having that. And that's okay. Like, I love you, right? But we mm. can't superimpose those things on other people. The, the gospel is already alienating enough, so we, 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 we must not add things to it. Theodoret of Seir said, The priests are anointed with holy oil and clothed with embroidered cloth and silk. It means riches, which the people gained as a result of his providence as much in spirit as in body. So he's saying mm. exactly what we're thinking. He's saying, yeah. He's saying, like, dude, leather boots, silk. Yeah, it's wealth, it's blessing, right? That's part of the anti fairy tale. And you're like, how is it an anti fairy tale? It's going so good. Well, just see where it goes. Thus, you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothing uh, was of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. You ate flour and honey and oil. Mm. You grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. And your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendor that I bestowed on you, declares the Lord. So the orphan gets saved, the saved becomes queen, and now, unfortunately, the queen becomes the, uh, a prostitute. But you trusted in your beauty and played the whore because of your renown and lavished your whorings on any passerby. Your beauty became his. 
And that's a repeated idea in the Bible, which is that when you trust in the thing that God has given you instead of the God who gave it to you, Mm. you are just losing spiritually. Mm. You Mm. are just losing spiritually. The most common thing that's condemned for in the Bible is wealth. People get wealth from God as a blessing. Then they trust in their wealth. And that is a massive L. It's a massive mistake. Verse 16, you took some of your garments and made for yourself colorful shrines, and on them you played the whore. The like has never been, nor ever shall be. Um, This is um, pretty aggressive language, uh, obviously. Verse 17, you took uh, your beautiful jewels of my gold and of my silver, of which I had given you, and you made yourself images of men, and with them played the whore. This is also very aggressive language. Like Aaron melting down the Mm -hmm. precious metals of God and forming them into a pagan image, and then... um, performing sexual rituals around and under them. I don't think it implies that the sexuality involved the idols, but that they were viewing the idols as commanding and receiving of the sexual acts that were taking place around them. Verse 18, you took your embroidered garments to cover them and I, and set my oil and my incense before them. Also my bread that I gave you. I fed you with fine flour and oil and honey. You set before them a pleasing aroma. Mm-hmm. So it was, declares the Lord God. So, they're using the items that have been made holy by God for the temple in their pagan practice. So this is like taking a pew from the church and bringing it to the strip club and like putting it there for people to sit on. It's taking something that obviously was made for a good righteous purchase and or purpose and yeah. using it for something else. And this idea of a pleasing aroma is also uh, an indictment against God. Ephesians 5, Philippians 4, Numbers 15, Genesis 8, Leviticus 1, all of those say, suggest, and communicate that God actually smells things and has an interaction with the smell of individual sacrifices, Mm -hmm. either literally or spiritually. And here, they're doing this pagan idea of like doing the thing that God commanded for him to an inanimate object that also is representative of a demon, I believe. Yeah, I think it's so interesting in verse 19. Mm -hmm. You can use the things God gave you for evil to... You can. It's the same with spiritual gifts, too, which is really hard, Mm -hmm. I think, for people to intellectually consent to, but it is the same. Yeah. You can use the gift of encouragement to manipulate. You can use the gift of proclamation to build a platform for yourself, right? Like. Wow. Verse 20, you took your sons and your daughters whom you had born to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. So this is a literal thing um, that the people of Israel literally did. And uh, this type of language helps people understand God's aggressive language in the Old Testament because they're like, oh, so what? They bowed down to an idol once. It's like that. That's not what they're talking about. Um, Were your whoring so small a matter that you slaughtered my children, delivered them up as an offering by fire to them, and in all your abominations and your whorings, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, wallowing in your blood. This is Baal worship. This is Asherah worship. This is ritual killings. And lest we think that we are better as a society, this is obviously analogous to abortion in literally every single way, except the idol is the self instead of an idol inside of a temple. Verse 23, and after all your wickedness, woe, woe to you, declares the Lord God. It's like an interjection of intense uh, personal grief and lamentation that God is letting out in that moment. You built yourself a vaulted chamber and made yourself a lofty place in every square. A vaulty chamber is a brothel, right? So you can see the anti-fairy tale. It just keeps getting worse. Mm-hmm. At the head of every street, you built your lofty place and made your beauty an abomination, offering yourself to any passerby and multiplying your whoring. So this is just um, prostitution language. He's like, you're building effectively brothels on every corner. You're using the thing that God gave you beauty to do the opposite of that. Um, The Septuagint just literally said it's a house of prostitution. um, Which I think is is a a great understanding of that idea. By the way, the NIV is a lot more graphic really really wise, yeah oh cool i'm glad we're in the esv then because this is making me a bit yeah. uncomfortable you're talking about the yeah my mom watches the podcast so i'm not gonna read it <laughs> you <laughs> thank can, you Logan. um verse 26 you also played the whore with the egyptians your lustful neighbors multiplying your whoring to provoke me to anger um um 
humans often don't have the understanding that God uh, cares about us. God made us in his image and the things that we do affect him um, emotionally because he is a personal, personal God. Uh, verse 27, behold, therefore, I stretch out my hand against you and diminished your allotted portion and delivered you to the greed of your enemies, the daughters of your Philistines who were ashamed of your lewd behavior. <laughs> Wait, so even the daughters of the Philistines are shocked by the lewd conduct, right? Because Philistines exactly. are very. Exactly. And it actually, go, you're right. And it goes further than that. Yeah. You played the whore also with the Assyrians because you were not satisfied. Yes, you played the whore with them. And still, you were not satisfied. That is the implication of being sexually satisfied. You multiplied your whoring also with the trading land of Chaldea. Even with this, you were not satisfied. So why does God use sexual imagery to describe spirituality? Because it helps people understand how important it is and how special it is, um, is why. Uh, verse 30, how sick is your heart, declares the Lord, because you did all these things. The deeds of a brazen prostitute, building your vaulted chamber at the head of every street, making your lofty place in every square. You weren't like a prostitute because you scorned payment. <laughs> wow. That's like the ultimate dunk of all time. It's like you did all that and you did it for free. A cheap prostitute. Yeah. You were, yep. But the, it, you scorned payment, meaning the payment was offered and you were like, nah, it's all good. <laughs> I enjoy this yeah. on its own. Like it's so aggressive, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think the feeling of uncomfortability, I think, is part of it on purpose. I think God is doing that on purpose to communicate the intensity of what he mm -hmm. feels, right? Yeah. Adulterous wife who receives strangers instead of her husband. The husband, of course, is God. Men give gifts to all prostitutes, but you gave your gifts to all your lovers, bribing them to come to you from every side with your whorings. So you were different from other women in your whorings. No one solicited you to play the whore, and you gave payment while no payment was given to you. <laughs> Just further and further. Therefore, you were different. That like might be one of the most indicting phrases in the entire Bible. Therefore, you were different. is Because um, holy means different. So you were actually <laughs> technically holy in the worst possible way. Wow. Uh, it's so unholy. indicting. Holy, unholy. Exact, yeah. Exactly. It's so aggressive and so indicting. indicting. Um, now we're going to um, part four. The prostitute gets taken. So we saw the orphan get saved. The saved become queen. The queen become a prostitute. And now the prostitute gets taken. Um, this is where Liam Neeson comes in. <laughs> she's been taken. Um <laughs> Whoa, that's a big deal. You got to say the title of the movie? That's so cool. <laughs> Therefore, O prostitute, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because your lust was poured out, your nakedness uncovered in your whorings with your lovers, with all your abominable idols, and because of the blood of your children that you gave to them. Therefore, behold, I'll gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure, all those you loved and all those you hated. I will gather them against you from every side and will uncover your nakedness to them that they may see all your nakedness. So this is a summary device and it's used twice. 37 in English really could open uh, as therefore look. We don't really use the word behold. It's like look or look out. Um, and we see um, th this, this nudity idea um, three times we see, we see that the, the the woman was naked and dying as an infant, naked and whoring as a married woman, and naked and exposed in shame here in this part. I will judge you, verse thirty eight, as a woman who uh, as women who commit adultery and shed blood are judged, and bring upon you the blood of wrath and jealousy. That's from Leviticus twenty and Deuteronomy twenty. Punishment is death. I will give you into their hands. They shall throw you down your vaulted chamber and break down your lofty places. They're just going to destroy the brothel. They'll strip you of your clothes and take your beautiful jewels and leave you naked and bare. Now, keep in mind, this is a 0% literal situation because I've seen some articles online. I saw some some articles in some some Bible journals about how Ezekiel 16 fuels the language of male violence. I don't personally think that's true, but I do think it's important for men to not like read this passage and be like, this is an acceptable way to talk. 
because that isn't what's being posited. That isn't what's being said no. in any way. That is that has nothing to do mm-hmm. with this. Verse 40, they'll bring up a crowd against you and they'll stone you and cut you to pieces with their swords. So remember that figuratively this happened. The, um, that the, the, the nation of Israel was literally divided um, and read the end of the book of Judges. Verse 41, they'll burn your houses and execute judgments on you in the sight of many women. I will s- make you stop playing the whore and you shall also give payment no more. So I will satisfy my wrath on you. My jealousy shall depart from you. I will be cal- calm and will no more be angry. I love that little verse because God is completely in control of his emotions. Mm. And I think that we inherently view jealousy. I, th- I think many people perceive jealousy as wrong. Mm-hmm. John Taylor says references to fury, jealousy, and wrath are readily misunderstood by readings of the Old Testament who think of them as essentially human and sinful qualities. Um, the truth is, is that there are a variety of emotions that can be good or bad. I made this handy dandy Venn diagram oh, for us. Nice. There are emotions like um, joy, love, compassion, sorrow. Those are good. Those are always good. Then there are emotions or um, attitudes like envy, terror, lust, greed, resentment, and selfishness. Those are always wrong. And then there are uh, actually in the center, there are emotions that can be either. So the emotion itself is not inherently wrong with the way you use it. Like anger, fear actually, jealousy, um, hatred actually, depression actually, guilt, pride, grief, wrath sorrow, and even laughter. Those are all things that the Bible describes as can be either of those things. And I think that perhaps that would be really healthy for people. That is very interesting. And also like a nice little break from the content of the chapter. I was going to say, if you've been listening to this on your commute into work, um, (laughs) like take a minute and listen to something (laughs) else before you go into the office. No, no, this is good because there's no way work's going to be worse than this. That's true. (laughs) Well, well, then flip it. If you're you're listening to this on your drive home from work, yeah, listen to sports talk radio or something before you go into the house. Because you have not remembered the days of your youth, Daniel Block notes that 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 word for remember doesn't denote simply the opposite of to forget because... um, The issue is not that she had forgotten her miserable origins or Yahweh's unrestrained favors. She simply failed to take them into account. Mm. That's the idea. It's not like you forgot. It's like you've chosen not to like integrate that into what's actually going on. Yeah. You have enraged me with all of these things. Therefore, Um, behold, all I've returned your deeds upon your head declares the lord have you committed lewdness in addition to your abominations and then next it moves into the section of the taken becomes a proverb behold everyone who uses proverbs will use this proverb about you so this is israelite maxim number four remember we're seeing these maxims in chapter 12 through 24 um like mother, like daughter. Um, you are the daughter of your mother, verse 45, who loathed her husband and her children. You are the sister of your sisters who loathed their husbands and their children. Your mother was a Hittite and your father was an Amorite. And so that's similar to before um, from, from the opening section. And it's just making these comments of accusing um, those nations of being... Um, full of misandry um which is if you don't know what that is it's the opposite of misogyny um um i made some memes about misandry (laughs) um here they are here are all of them enjoy um (laughs) told him i love you he said cool story bro oh no you know what i didn't make these i actually found them um verse 46 
And your elder sister in Samaria, who lived with her daughters to the north of you, and your younger sister, who lived in the south, Sodom is with her daughters. You get what they're saying? They're still taking care of their people. That's the idea. Um, despised people and places are still doing it. Verse 47, not only did you walk in their ways and do according to their abominations within a very little time, you were more corrupt than they in all your ways. Daniel Block says, unlike Cinderella of fairy tale fame, her corruption exceeded theirs. Beginning with the smaller sister, Yahweh affirms on, on oath that even Sodom, the archetype of wickedness in Jewish tradition, and her daughters were no match for Jerusalem. As I live, uh, declares the Lord, your sister Sodom and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. And this is um, correctly interpreted by some people as expressing that when people say that the only part about Sodom and Gomorrah was um, homosexual activity, that is actually an incorrect reading of um, this text and the text in Genesis. Um, and so some people have done some good work there. Verse 50, they were haughty and did an abomination before me, so I removed them when I saw it. Samaria hasn't committed half <laughs> of your sins. You've committed more abominations than they and you've made your sisters appear righteous by all the abominations that you have committed, right? So we see this like anti fairy tale here, which just brings to mind these. <laughs> Started from the bottom, now I'm here. <laughs> Cinderella. That's yeah. The one. It's just like this anti fairy tale idea. This really is one of the only passages in the whole Bible that really feels like this. Bear your disgrace, you also, for you've intervened on behalf of your sisters because of your sins in which you acted more abominably than they. They are more in the right than you. So be ashamed, you also. Bear your disgrace, for you've made your sisters appear righteous. So now we see the taken becomes a proverb. The takers get restored. That's the next part. So this is the turn, right? It's like, you thought Israel was going to jump the shark, right? But it's not. Um, verse 53, I will restore their fortunes, both the fortunes of Sodom and her daughters and the fortunes of Samaria and her daughters, and I will restore your own fortunes in your midst, right? This is like quintessential, like c literally cannot believe the mercy of God. Wow that you may bear your disgrace and be ashamed of all that you've done, becoming a consolation to them. As for your sisters, Sodom and her daughters shall return to their former state, and Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former state. Former state is it implies positivity. Was not your sister Sodom a byword in the day of pride? Um... This is true. This is same in the literal Bible. This is the idea that the word has become synonymous with an insult. We talked about this in like one of the last two episodes. I'm not going to read through all of these, but this is this idea here that it has become um, directly illustrative of, of an idea. Verse 57, before your wickedness was uncovered, uh, now you've become an object of reproach for the daughters of Syria and all those all around you, her, and for the daughters of the Philistines, those all around who despise you. He's like, your name's a joke. It's the punchline. Yeah. The Hebrew word implies gossip, a noteworthy item, something everyone cares about kind of, but mostly to mock and use for joke fodder. That's the idea there. You bear the penalty of your lewdness and your abominations, declares the Lord reminds me of Romans 1. The language is very similar. And then, here we go. Twist ending. Ezekiel's going to shamal on us here. <laughs> He's going to twist the ending on us. Takers get restored. But the proverb, continuing on from number 5, becomes a wife again. We see another revelation connection here. 
Z the, the female figure of Zion is always explained as the many people of Israel. The antithesis to the woman uh, is the harlot in uh, Revelation chapters 17 and 18. And so we see Ezekiel 16 referenced there and how it is a part of, or, or at the very least, a prefiguring image of this. Verse 59, for thus says the Lord, I will deal with you as you have done. You who have despised the oath in breaking the covenant, yet I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth. I will establish with you an everlasting covenant. He is saying it doesn't matter how many times you've moved away. I am going to supersede complete the covenants with Abraham, David, and Moses, and I'm going to bring about a forever covenant. That's the covenant of Christ. He's saying there is redemption. There is hope. And in that way, the fairy tale really does turn into you, a, a real fairy tale. Yeah. Because it, it actually really flips at the end. Uh, you'll remember your ways and be ashamed when you take your sisters, both your elder and your younger, and I gave them to you as daughters, but not on account of the covenant with you. I'll establish my covenant with you, and you will know that I'm the Lord that you may remember and be confused and never open your mouth again because of your shame. When I atone for you, all that you have done, declares the Lord. That's massive. Because atonement is a massive, massive word. It's used 44 times in Leviticus alone. The idea of atone is to cover this is a big idea. It's very clear what the text is saying here. The text flips at the end. So realistically, you could have called it a fairy tale because at the end, it is good. It is in a good place. And not only is it in a good place, it's in a good place currently and prophetically. So he's saying, yes, um, there is an answer. There is a new covenant. There is redemption. There is hope. There is joy. There is something coming because I am going to atone for you. Uh, atonement means a covering of something. That's what it literally means. He is going to cover the sins of the people, all of the sins, all of this entire ridiculous story that is so hard to get through. Look at how good God truly is to his people. Look at yeah. how brilliantly good God truly is. Um, love covers sin. Um, and I want to talk about one theological idea, which is that the word atonement is not used in the New Testament. And I want to just clear that up for people really quick because it's a, it's a, a somewhat common question. Um, I think I learned this from Piper. Um, oh, yeah, it says it right there. As time passed, the English word atonement became almost entirely a theological word, re referring very generally to the way the broken relationship between God and man could be made right. So the Oxford Dictionary says... As uh, applied to the redemptive work of Christ, atonement is variously used by theologians in the sense of reconciliation, propitiation, and expiation. So uh, what he's saying there is um, um, uh, that's what the word atonement became symbolic for uh, or, or, or representative of in English. Okay, So then um, the reason that atonement is not used in the New Testament is because there are just more different words for it. That's the general idea. I just didn't want to confuse anyone who, um, when they heard me say that atonement's about Christ, it obviously is, but then they may say, well, that's not, the word's not used in the New Testament. Um, so I wanted to help anybody who thought that. Um, Piper points out that they use a word, uh, one word to draw out the ransom in Mark 10, a word to get at the meaning of redemption in Ephesians 1, a meaning to draw out, a word to draw out propitiation in Romans 3, a word to draw out the meaning of reconciliation in Romans 5, a word for purification for sins in Hebrews 1, two different words of Christ's sacrifice in Hebrews 7, and um, I do think atonement is used in the New Testament because it does say in 1 Peter 4, 8 that love covers sin. Love covers sin, and the atonement is the idea of covering. That's what's being prophesied here. Despite everything, love has covered sin. And so the wild part about the anti-fairy tale turned real fairy tale is the only way to read it is to see yourself in the role 
of the villain. That is the, that is the way it is meant to be communicated and said. And so when we see uh, in evil a reflection of other people, we're doing it wrong. But when we see in it a reflection of ourselves and our great need for atonement, our great need for covering, our great need for our sins, mistakes, slip ups, trip ups and screw ups to be covered by the blood of Jesus, we get that. We we get that. And so realistically, you could take this and you could add you know, and additional parts to the story um, from the New Testament because of the beautiful um, redemption of God. This brings me back to Genesis 3 when God physically covered and clothed them. Like every time it said, he covered and I will cover you, it just reminds me of the very beginning of the story. Like it was done back then and it has been ever since how beautiful the love of god which supersedes logic and reasonableness mm -hmm. and this is a thing i think people are missing because they want the gospel to just be verses 59 through 63 mm -hmm. and it's not it's just not if you don't understand your own sinfulness then the gospel can never be what mm -hmm. it is what it truly mm -hmm. is right. yeah God isn't saving you from your great self to mm -hmm. make you 10% better. Right. Yeah, I think it's Blaise Pascal that said, and I'm roughly quoting here, so you'll have to look it up, but said it's possible to know uh, Jesus without knowing God and your need for him. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it puts it into perspective, the real need that we have which is really beautiful. And I hope that that encourages you today as you are about to watch Napoleon <laughs> or this Tom Brady documentary. <laughs> Podcast sponsored by Apple TV. Yeah. <laughs> I really hope that encourages someone out there today. Um, there is no, uh, sh certainly no one would suggest that they've screwed up more times than the woman character in that story. I don't think it's possible that anyone could. I really don't. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that. The gospel reaches all the way across the aisle, all the way across all chasms and distances, right to you, right where you are at. If you showed the first 58 verses of that story to 100,000 people and then said, what happens? None of them would say, what actually happened? Yeah. Because God and his redemption arc and his desire, the love that radiates from Jesus Christ to all people is absolutely impossible to be stopped. And the love of Jesus would extend all the way to you. The Bible says that in Romans 5, that God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And for a long time, I thought that Jesus only loved the sanctified me, but mm. he loved the sinful me. Mm. And I read a book recently that says when you sin, don't like run away from your sin to the love of God. I know that can sound weird theologically, but just give me a second to make my point, which is, of course, turn from your sin. Of course, don't continue in it, but don't like act like it isn't real and then walk into the love of God. Come to the love of God carrying the sin that you have committed and see that God loves you in that and then give it over to him. I hope that that comes across right in the way I'm trying to communicate. I'm just trying to communicate what it says in Romans 5. So um, thank you guys so much for watching. Were you guys surprised by the twist ending? Yeah, I mean, I knew it was, we've been hyping up chapter 16. Yeah. And so I knew it was going to be NSFW. <laughs> uh, which I think should be the thumbnail. Yes. Um, but yes. uh, the, yeah, the end, those last what, what, five, six verses of the, of the covenant, like all that, like God's anger and wrath is so obvious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like, but, <laughs> you know, it's a really big, but, but I'm going to establish a covenant yes. and it's going to apply not just to you. Um, and I just, yes. yeah real sobering it's it's 60 verses of how awful yeah. you are yeah and then five of but that's okay yeah totally totally 
it's like it's like the end of all those M Night Shyamalan movies. <laughs> it's like what was the point of all that then? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Would love it if you'd like, uh, comment, share. Don't share it with anybody who this will offend. Don't try to upset them. But uh, much love. We'll see you soon.